The amount of energy available to man controls his progress. Throughout history, he has used fire, electricity, and even the atom. But these sources eventually will end. One unlimited source has always been available. That source is the sun. These people are inventing and developing the most efficient devices ever built for producing solar power. Mr. Calvin D. McCracken is president of Jet Heat Incorporated and is currently working on a device to produce mechanical energy directly from the sun's rays. Dr. Peter E. Glaser of Arthur D. Little Incorporated has built a solar furnace which produces temperatures high enough to melt asbestos and he's actually doing high temperature research. Today, these scientists are discussing the problems of solar power with your host on 2000 AD, Professor Jonathan Karras of the University of New Hampshire. We're breaking up into a number of groups, and we know that you can convert solar energy to uh, thermal, that one of the groups we mentioned, chemical, mm -hmm. electrical, and also your uh, comments were, Dr. Glazer, that low and high temperatures are Indeed, important. high temperature. And so well, here's uh, sort of a model, I guess, uh, showing an application of solar energy into the conversion into electricity. And Dr. Glazer, if you'll be the backstop there, maybe we can actually get the little automobile to operate here by solar energy. Uh, this is the model that was sent to us by General Motors, but it indicates some advanced thinking. Now, how practical is this? Well, at the moment, it does seem to us that there's a definite limitation to that use. You see, uh, if you get one horsepower per square yard, theoretically, and you have maybe the most 10 square yards on the top of a car, it wouldn't be a very strong car, maybe five horsepower. Well, why don't we take a look at some of these solar cells? I got a number of samples here from uh, Hoffman Electronics, and uh, it's interesting what they have been able to do with them. They are quite small and still uh, quite efficient. Here are a number of them in various stages of assembly, etc., and take a good look at those. Now, the efficiency of these is, uh, does have a certain maximum, doesn't it, Dr. Uh, yes, Glazer? Yes, it is about 12 percent, and uh, actually the development of these cells uh, culminates uh, a long study and research. Uh, at first, they tried just using the uh, electric energy developed by dissimilar metals, and then uh, went on to the uh, effect of batteries uh, as light shines on them. Here's a multiple unit. Uh, obviously, the more elements, uh, the higher output you can get. And of course, some uh, here's a, really a small individual one. Now, I think it's important here, isn't it, gentlemen, to point out that this is different from a regular photoelectric cell, which a person may have in an exposure meter, because it's only about 1% efficient, I understand. Yes, uh, the material of these cells which you have there is uh, silicon, while the uh, photo cell is selenium. Now, we were talking about a number of things here, and one of them that we mentioned earlier is the low temperature idea. What other devices here depend on the low temperatures available from solar energy? Well, let me answer that by saying that what is needed in the solar energy field is a, is a Henry Ford to come along and mass produce at low cost these vast areas of solar collectors that are required to make it possible. See, solar energy, it, by definition, is a diffuse energy. It's come a long way. and. Uh, also, in areas where uh, you have a lot of solar energy, you've got dry climate. It's an arid climate. So first of all, you need water, and pumping of water we saw here. A second thing would be uh, purifying the water. Then also you have a hot climate there, and you need air conditioning. Or you could use water heating. And all of those are possible. Heating of homes and the power production are also possibilities. Perhaps one of the youngsters watching today might be this Henry Ford we're looking for. So he certainly has a wide field for his application there. Good. Uh, now, uh, I read quite a bit about a solar still. In fact, I brought along an example here of some work that has been done on a solar still. And I wonder if we could take a look at this and see what comments you have about the idea of distilling or purifying water. What would you say about this, Mr. McCracken? Well, these uh, are quite possible. They're working today. They're going to be tested in quantities very soon. Uh, this still works by having the salt or brackish water 
come in through the top. The tube at the top comes down and it uh, uh, soaks up inside. The heat of the sun comes in and evaporates, vaporizes the water, and then you have a relatively cold cover plate, a glass plate on the front. The water, pure water, condenses on that and runs down into uh, the bucket, and the salt water goes out another place. So this really works, uh, purifying water by solar energy. In fact, we have a sketch here, uh, which perhaps may uh, make your explanation a little bit clearer. Uh, there it is, showing how the solar energy comes in and the uh, pure water does go off at the yes. side. Yes, yes, that's right. Now, we've seen that there's a number, uh, there are a number of avenues of approach here on the utilization of solar energy. First of all, uh, chemical, which we didn't deal on at all, but uh, some time ago we did uh, yes, dwell on is, algae. Uh, the uh, uh, growing of, of algae as a food and thus uh, having a means of uh, changing uh, the sun's energy in the type of energy which we either can use or uh, burn as fuel. And the electrical one is the uh, electrical cells which we've explained, thermal. Uh, your pump, I think, is a good example. Yeah, and then there's another type of chemical process in this heat storage, in this uh, solar energy field, and that storage of heat, which you mentioned before. You can store heat either in uh, uh, stones or in water, uh, but we at uh, Jet Heat have been doing quite a bit of work on chemical heat storage. Dr. Telkes is with us, and she started the idea at MIT on storing heat uh, by the heat of fusion of chemicals. Well, you do your work in Englewood, New Jersey. That's where your laboratories are. That's right, and these uh, byproducts of solar energy can be used in all kinds of fields like packaging and so forth to stabilize temperatures. But there are a lot of avenues of research here, I think, uh, important to us in that youngsters who are young by definition now are getting into a field which is uh, quite fascinating. Here you have something for nothing. Well, uh, the solar <laughs> energy field uh, has uh, at the moment only its surface scratched as far as the practical application are concerned. We, are, we hope that uh, in a way it will expand and that it will help us to uh, tap the unlimited resources that perhaps thermonuclear reaction will one day hold for us. In other words, you're trying to do research to see how you can contain high temperature reactions is the reason for your that particular building of the solar right, mirror. Yes. Whereas your particular interest, Mr. McCracken, is to uh, develop a pumping system or a system to get mechanical energy yeah, economically. We're more of the mass production applications of solar energy because, you see, uh, solar energy doesn't have a weapon like atomic energy does, which is what really make, made atomic energy come of age. Two billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, more than that, I guess. Uh, solar energy has got to be cheaper. It's got to be really competitive, and uh, it's got to emphasize the free fuel before it can uh, compete. You well, in, in our economy, I think it's the only sign is that if it's cheaper than other types of fuel, then it will be used. And it has to first become competitive before it will be successfully used in the heating of houses or even the cooling of houses. Or, uh, let's say, today it's used in Florida uh, to heat hot water for the home use. Now, I wonder if either of you, I hope, would be willing to speculate a little bit about, oh, a decade or two or five or ten from now, do you think we could power a spaceship using solar energy? Well, once you get the spaceship out of uh, the Earth's gravitational field and out into space, then it might be possible to uh, get enough power to power the spaceship. The fact there's a limitation of size, though. How well, uh, out in space, a limitation of size perhaps is not so important. We are today thinking of putting uh, solar collecting mirrors up on a space platform and thus have energy available there uh, to do whatever we want to do with it. Well, now, in uh, an application of this type here, which is an artist's conception of what's coming up in the future, there are attenuators, etc. I know you, you have, have been listening like to Dr. Peter Glaser and Mr. Calvin McCracken discussing the future of solar power with Professor Jonathan Karras of the University of New Hampshire.